Good afternoon everyone, it's David Schlothauer here in the Home Weather Office with a detailed El Nino forecast, outlook, and discussion for June the 5th, 2023. Also, if you're new to the channel and you really like these detailed discussions on Enzo, please consider subscribing, hitting the like button, sharing this video with your family and friends on social media, and lastly, leave an awesome comment in the section below this video. So without further ado, let's get started talking about what El Nino is up to and how strong will it get for the rest of the summer season into the fall and winter. So of course, we do have an El Nino watch that is currently issued right now. We are looking at near to above average sea surface temperatures across the Pacific Ocean, but given with what I'm about to show you, I wouldn't be surprised if this watch gets upgraded to a, an advisory in the next couple of months or so. A transition into a El Nino is very much likely during the Northern Hemisphere winter, which is a 90% chance of that occurring. But again, we're probably seeing El Nino developing already, um, given how warm the sea surface temperatures actually are above normal. We can see this on the recent evaluation of equatorial Pacific sea surface temperature departures, where we have had some significant warming since March, uh, especially more recently, we have had another Kelvin wave that has been propagating eastward, which has led to a pretty big abrupt rise in sea surface temperatures and lower than normal sea level pressures over the central and eastern Pacific basin. Now, for reference, this is a thumbnail view of the different basins of where we are seeing our sea surface temperature departures coming from. So the El Nino 4 region is the yellow area. That's the boxed highlighted yellow. This is the El Nino 3.4 region, which is boxed in black here. You can't miss that at all. And this is the El Nino 3 in red. And this is the El Nino 1 plus 2 region in white. So you can see the different basins of of what their trends are looking like here in the last 12 months. Definitely on the incline here on all of the basins, which indicates we are very much likely experiencing or about to experience an El Nino at any time. In fact, the El Nino 3.4 region is already about 0.8 degrees Celsius above normal, which what you need is 0.5 Celsius or greater above normal for it to even be a weak El Nino. And so the Nino 3.4 is already representing that. In fact, all of the basins are representing a weak to moderate to strong El Nino at this given time as of this video making of June the 5th. All right, so this is a look at the sea surface temperature departures in the tropical Pacific during the last four weeks, and we can definitely see that warm tongue. You cannot miss it at all. Definitely well apparent there on the weekly average or the monthly average, we should say, running from May 7th through the 3rd of June. Back some of the anomalies here off the Peru coast are still running about three to five Celsius above normal. So let's go forward here. Let's skip forward. Uh, the, we're not going to look at that, but what we are going to look at is our central and eastern Pacific upper ocean heat content uh, weekly average temperature anomalies. So what this is showing us is, is our subsurface above normal or is it below average as far as those temperatures go is a heat content there. And of course, we are seeing above average upper ocean heat content below the surface of the ocean. So in the subsurface, we are above normal. Now, this has leveled off a little bit, but we're still running about a Celsius or so above normal as far as the, um, the amount of heat energy that is being um, congealed uh, just below the surface. All right, so that's quite a bit of energy, and this is going to lead to that El Nino. And it already is. So we can see on our NOAA Coral Reef Watch daily 5 kilometer sea surface temperature anomalies here. Uh, as of June the 4th, this is delayed by one day. But it really gives us an idea that there is definitely quite a bit of warming. I mean, look at this. The Central Pacific already running about a half a degree to almost a degree Celsius above normal. And then we can see our... Um, 
our El Nino 3 area here, sea surface temperatures are running about 2 to almost 3 Celsius above normal, and then 3 to 4 Celsius in the Nino 1 plus 2 region, which is off the Peru coast. So this is definitely an El Nino by all standards. Now the PMM, uh, which is negative right now, is putting a lid on things, I believe, on this El Nino, but I think that PMM, uh, PMM, if I can get it correctly, will eventually probably be fading away over the next few months. But not only that, even so we are talking about El Nino, I really want to briefly talk about the Atlantic Basin because there is some Twitter posts coming around about this. This is pretty concerning. This is a very, very warm in uh, NAO, um, all right, and this is a very warm Iberian Peninsula current um, that is kind of running right down into Africa, into the, say, the Cabo Verde Islands. Sea surface temperatures here in the main development region are well over 2 Celsius above normal for this time of the year. And I will be talking about that when I make my Atlantic Hurricane Outlook and discussion for tomorrow that's what uh is on uh, on my plate tomorrow to talk about because it's definitely a concern and that's going to lead to more of a concern by the time we go into the latter part of the summer season into the peak of hurricane season now switching gears back to our main topic is el nino here subsurface temperature anomalies here are really really warm i mean still over in the three to four degrees Celsius above normal region, uh, between about 50 meters all the way down to 200 meters below the surface. Why this is important is meaning that there's a lot more heat content. There's a lot of heat energy below and stored below the surface of the ocean to give us such a moderate to strong El Nino event this fall and winter time. Look at the uh, anomalies of, as of May 28th here, very far above normal. I mean, that's the darkest red you can get. That's 4 to 5 Celsius, maybe even some 6 Celsius subsurface waters here above normal, just below the surface. So it is going to be interesting to see with what all happens here when we get some upwelling of some of this. going to be uh, really interesting to see. Uh, how that's going to really respond to the ocean and we can already get an idea of that 28 celsius 29 to 30 celsius not far to the west here and this is all sloshing over towards the east and it's going to give us one of the biggest el nino events in quite some time not the strongest ever recorded but it is going to rank among the top three probably of being one of the stronger el nino events for the fall and winter season so as far as how strong will El Nino get, you are probably wondering, you're probably asking me this all the time, how strong or how much stronger will El Nino get? Well, the answer here is we're still looking at about 2 Celsius on the ensemble mean forecast. There are still some model uh, members that still want this up to about 2 to 2.5, equally as low here on the 1.5 to 2 Celsius uh, by the time we go into, say, October, November, and December. So fairly a strong El Nino event is still looking very likely at this point. There's nothing that's going to stop this from developing. I still have my hopes up that this is going to be a fairly impactful El Nino event for the winter season for the United States. So now let's take a look here at our recent uh, preliminary southern oscillation index values here we always want to look at this because this gives us an idea on what the pressure pattern is looking like between Tahiti and Darwin which is uh, Darwin is in Australia Tahiti is in the central and eastern Pacific this has taken a very big nosedive I mean there is no doubt about it at all a month ago we were in the positives, technically speaking, in the 30-day average as of May 7th here. Ever since then, we are really just dropping as of uh, June the 5th, negative 19.21 and still falling actively right now. It's about how low can you go at this point. The 90-day average is definitely in El Nino criteria. You need negative 7 or lower for the Southern Oscillation Index to be declared in El Nino. 
So right now we're at negative 7.5 roughly. And that indicates we're already in a El Nino state, I believe. The 90-day average, the oh yeah, 30-day and the 90-day are both in the El Nino territory. I mean, wow, negative 19 on that index is pretty phenomenal. So we just talked about this. Let's go and look at this. Uh, yeah, right here. Um, 850 millibar uh, winds, uh, wind anomalies. Oranges indicate weaker than normal trade winds. Bluer colors indicate stronger than normal trade winds. So we're already seeing a Kelvin wave, a convective uh, coupled Kelvin wave propagating eastward with time. This has yielded weaker than normal trade wind anomalies from about the international dateline all the way over to about 140 degrees west longitude, which indicates that this is why El Nino is developing at a little quicker pace thanks to that. We can see the upward motion um, being represented over the international dateline with sinking motion represented there in uh, yellow and brown over uh, Western Pacific and the Indonesia area, contributing to the higher normal than sea level pressures. All right, so we have filled in the box here as far as your El Nino goes for uh, for the month uh, for the May time frame here. here. We're 0 0.1 Celsius above normal now. Remember, we were at negative minus or yeah minus 0 0.1 Celsius. We have warmed up two more points there. Not as quick as the previous month, but still we are warming up nicely here for the March, April, May average. The three-month mean blended is looking like that. We'll see with what the next boxes show, but I'm very much thinking that we're going to have an El Nino. No doubt at all in my mind. There is a greater than 90% chance that El Nino will develop by the late fall, early winter time frame. That's a guarantee with very little in the way of neutral conditions and no chances of La Nina conditions returning at all for the winter season. So you can cross uh, La Nina out for the winter season, which is good for some, but bad for other locations. You know, it really disrupts our weather pattern. Now, I did want to show you all the climate model here for as far as the CANSIPS model. I don't want to really look at the CFS. You know, it, I don't know what it's on. It wants uh, very dry weather conditions across portions of the desert southwest and the west coast for the winter and even for the deep south. It's like, what the heck? I'm not going to look at this model. So we're going to look at the CANSIPS model in this forecast. And what it illustrates is... Look at the jet stream. By the time we go into December and January, my goodness, this is a very strong jet stream from the west impacting much of the deep south, the southeastern U.S. and the Pacific uh, southwest here of California, as well as Nevada. Because of this amplified storm track, we're likely to see above normal rainfall, and this continues all the way into March and April, where we might see above normal precipitation. Let's take a look now at the uh, forecast here as far as the CANSIPs go. And we can see by the time we go into December, above normal precipitation for California and Nevada. That will continue all the way into January. Look at this. The CANSIPs highlighting a, a very active storm track for the deep south, for the southeast, and also for California and Nevada like we had last winter where it was pretty devastating. Lots of flooding, mudslides, debris flows, strong winds, heavy snowpack. We're going to probably see the same thing again this winter season. So looking pretty active for January. Uh, below average for February, which is quite interesting for California, but above and normal for the southeast, and that could continue all the way through April and May. Now, as far as how strong El Nino could get, let's take a look here at the CFS, because that's probably the only um, accurate model to look at as far as sea surface temperature anomalies go, and we can see definitely a very strong signal here by December, by January, and February as far as that El Nino goes now really quickly i'm just going to kind of go off topic here and look at the atlantic hurricane season really quickly um there have been a lot there's been some rumors going around saying that this is going to be a very busy atlantic hurricane season i'm starting to believe that a little bit more but i'm still kind of on my low end forecast i'm really not excited about the season because we have el nino but now I'm starting to believe because we're having a very warm Atlantic basin now. Really has warmed up re recently. 
and I'm now believing more of the CFS that we could have a very busy season here for July. For the Central Atlantic, for the main development region, this could carry on into August. Look at this, really, really above average anomalous precipitation, which again could mean tropical storms, hurricanes, or major hurricanes, and that could continue. But notice how it fades away by September here. We might have a below average look here to the MDR region with above normal precipitation here for portions of the Dominican Republic, for the Windward Leeward Islands and then turning below average because of that El Nino that is well established. So it could be a very busy season here for June, July, August, and maybe even into the peak of hurricane season for September. Well, that is gonna sum it up for today's El Nino outlook and discussion here for June the 5th, 2023. I hope this video helped you out a lot, folks. If it did, please consider subscribing, hitting the like button, and sharing this video with your family and friends on social media. I am going to do a hurricane outlook and discussion tomorrow since we kind of need to talk about the tropics since we are, after all, in the Atlantic hurricane season period.